USA Today recently reported on a new religious cult. Their practices include outdoor nude meditation, the rejection of all familial relationships, and they have taken as their core symbol a hangman's noose. Now that last detail is not true. The first two are, as bizarre as they are. But the absurdity and the stigma that we might attach to a hangman's noose and all of the negative ideas with it come close to the way that the Roman world would have viewed a religious group, a newly formed religious group, that took as its central symbol a cross. The Roman lawyer Cicero said, the very word cross should be far removed, not only from the person of a Roman citizen, but from his thoughts, his eyes, and his ears. The Jews believed that anyone who was hanged, impaled, or crucified fell under the curse of Deuteronomy 21-23. A hanged man is cursed by God. As we continue our study of 1 Corinthians and we come into chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul the Apostle pivots from the word of wisdom in verse 17 to the word of the cross. In verse 18, the Corinthian Christians were in danger because they viewed the world's wisdom and its definition of power and pomp in the way that led them potentially to reject the word of the cross. And so as we look at verses 18 through 25 together this morning, Notice what Paul says to the Corinthian Christians about the cross. He says that it saves. He says that it separates. And he says that it scandalizes. And he opens in verse 18 with this idea that the word of the cross separates. It separates all the people in the world into two groups. This is what he says. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. There are two groups of people in the world. Those who are in the process of perishing and those who are in the process of being saved. We can think about what Paul says with the image of the Titanic sinking. When it first sailed, the Titanic was the nicest ship in the world. Well appointed, opulently decorated, especially in those places that were going to be frequented by its wealthiest passengers. But imagine clinging to trinkets to remain on the Titanic as it sunk to the bottom of the ocean. This world is destined for corruption. And there are people who are clinging to it, not knowing they're headed for the bottom of an abysmal ocean. And then there are those who are on a lifeboat. We think about what that really means. At first, we have denied the sinking ship. So we were saved when we left it. We're in the process of being saved. We're on that lifeboat, but we haven't reached our final destination yet. So we're also looking for salvation in the presence of God. Paul says there are two groups of people in the world. He's not being classist. He is speaking to the reality That there is one moment in history that separates all people based upon our reception of it. The cross. That thing of shame 
and guilt. And he says that there are two ways that these two classes of people view that cross. To some it is folly. The Romans understood. They had designed it as such that citizens were exempt from it. Only slaves and foreigners were sentenced to death on a cross. So it became a symbol of guilt. You only went there if the state said you were guilty. Of shame, because you weren't high-born. And ultimately of defeat, because everyone who went to a cross died on it. So for many, the word of a cross was folly. And for many, unfortunately, it still is. But you notice Paul saying something very interesting in verse 18. For he contrasts the word of the cross as folly to those who are perishing, but not as wisdom to the saved. He'll get there. But as power. And this too is absurd That a cross would be viewed as a source of power. But the Christian knows it is. I think we're going to sing the song later today. There's power in the blood. So is it folly or is it power? There is great danger to the church in Corinth and to the church today that we become indistinguishable from the world. A Christian is like a person who is facing the wrong direction on an elevator. Our very existence makes the world uncomfortable because we have taken a symbol of shame and held it up as a symbol of glory. Jesus told His disciples in John chapter 15, verse 19, If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. But you know what? We are human beings, and we don't like to be hated. We don't like it. We want to feel normal and accepted. And there's a great danger to the church because we are not normal. And we're not to be accepted if we have indeed embraced the word of the cross because it has turned the world on its head. Because in accepting the word of the cross, we have rejected the world's definition of wisdom, power, and success. Now, our goal is not to be different. Our goal is not to look for offense in everything that happens around us. Our goal is not to play the victim, but as strange as it sounds, our goal is to cling to an instrument of torture, the cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Yes. Because the cross separates. It separates us from a world that is destined for destruction and allows us to be in a place where God saves us. And that's what Paul says next. Not only does the cross separate, but also the cross saves. Picking up in verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. The cross not only separates, but also it saves. Paul seeks to show that God's wisdom is in contrast to the wisdom of the world, which is foolish and ineffective. And he starts with an example from Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 14. 
He says, in quotation, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. If we go back to the book of Isaiah, we will find that those in Jerusalem were afraid. They were afraid of the terrible Assyrian army. And so they sought a treaty with Egypt. And they thought that with Egypt as their backers, they might be protected from Assyria. But irony of ironies, it was their treaty with Egypt that spooked the Assyrians into attacking them. And this was the will of God. He says, I'm going to show you your wisdom accounts for nothing. What you think is powerful, it's not powerful. When you think you can outsmart me, as I've told you, you're going to be punished for your unfaithfulness. Your own actions are not going to get you away, but are actually going to bring the thing that I've promised. And so Paul gives the example of God's wisdom defeating human wisdom. And then he asks three questions, as he has already done more than once in the first 18 verses of this book. He says, where is the wise one? Where's the philosopher? Where's that Greek guy? With his hand under his chin. Where's the scribe? Where's that Jewish guy? With the most training and education. And where's the debater of the age? Where's the guy who is so well trained and so knowledgeable that it doesn't matter what your background, whether Jewish or Greek, he's going to bring you to your feet in applause. Where's that guy in the sight of God? He says, nowhere to be found is the expectation in the language. Because God has taken the wisdom of the world and turned it to folly. And in fact, Paul says, it was God's purpose not to be known through human wisdom. Because if God could be known through human wisdom, then knowing God would become a point of human pride. And so he chose in his wisdom to take a thing of shame and make it a thing of glory. It was God's purpose not to be known through worldly wisdom. And so Paul says, it pleased God. This is a phrase that appears throughout Scripture. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Now there are two ways that many have understood Paul's statement in the last part of verse 21. And the English Standard Version actually shows it in its footnote. Paul says, through the folly of what we preach or through the folly of preaching. So the question is, is it what is being said or is it the very act of preaching that is viewed as foolish? And I don't know if Paul intended one over the other, but I would say that most of us have seen both rejected. That the folly of the message to Jews and Greeks alike, that a cross could be the source of salvation when it is viewed as a source of shame and death, that's just impossible. But then there's also this very idea that preaching this message could somehow save people. And we've seen it in our own world. The late Samuel Clemens, who wrote under the name Mark Twain, said in his own private writings, I do not know what we should do without the pulpit. I think we could better spare the sun, the moon anyway. He was being sarcastic. And even the very word preach has taken a negative meaning. Don't you dare preach at me. But it's not just any message, is it? Preaching is viewed as naive, uneducated, judgmental, but the preaching of the cross leads to salvation by the wisdom of God. Thank God the cross saves. The cross teaches us that God's wisdom differs from the wisdom of the world. And we need that message. For as wise as we think ourselves to be, history has shown over and over again, we're not. 
But it also teaches us something else. That the pathway to victory comes through self-sacrifice. Through the abandonment of self-reliance, as one author said. The word of the cross not only calls powerful what the world calls shameful, but it teaches us that we must engage in self-sacrifice if we're to experience the wisdom and power of God. And we do this when we participate in the cross by obeying the Gospel. Believing that Jesus is the Christ. Turning away from sin. Confessing Him as Lord. And participating in His death in the waters of baptism. We let go. We can bring nothing to the cross. For Jesus has paid it all, we sing. And there, in a symbol of shame, we share in the glory of God. Thank God for the cross that separates us from a world that is destined for corruption, that saves us. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Oh yes. Keep me near the cross. Finally, Paul says, the cross scandalizes. Verses 22-25. through 25. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach a crucified Christ. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Those who adhere to worldly thought cannot embrace the cross. Paul says the Jews seek signs, but in the cross they find scandal. The Jews had a very clear idea in their minds of what the Christ should be. That He was to be a powerful victor. A king like David, who would drive out the enemy and unite the people of God. And so for them, looking for power, signs of power from God, they found scandal in a cross. It was an oxymoron. Paul says, we preach a crucified Christ. No such thing exists. It's kind of like fried ice cream. You can't really do it. A crucified Christ. But in the wisdom of God, the cross is power. That God shows His power in sacrificing Himself for all people. He uses the scandalous to achieve the glorious. Only God could take a symbol of shame and turn it into the symbol of the single greatest powerful act of recreation the world has ever known. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. The cross is an act of recreation in which God makes new the world. We see that another time in Scripture. If you go back in your Bible to the book of Genesis and you read the narrative of Genesis, you see that the flood is presented in terminology that calls back to the creation. But the flood is a, is a, a temporary attempt by God in His perfect wisdom and plan to deal with the problem of sin. And what do we see in the flood? Great power. Most of the people die and one man symbolically is saved. And the symbol of that salvation, the rainbow that even children look at in awe today, an act of recreation in which the world dies and one man is saved. But what is the cross? A symbol of shame. But also a symbol of an act in which one man dies so the world can be saved. Not the kind of power the Jews were looking for. Not the signs they wanted. But to those who are being saved. The power of God. He says the Jews seek signs. The Greeks seek wisdom. It is commonly understood 
that some of the greatest thinkers the world has ever known came from the Greek Empire. You've heard their names. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Historians today and those who study such things would suggest that much of the world as we know it exists because of the foundation of Greek philosophers. But the greatest minds of the West could not have conceived of the word of the cross that saves men from our sins. The Jews seek signs. The Greeks want wisdom. But we preach a crucified Christ. We preach an object and a symbol of shame. What does the world today want? If the Jews wanted signs and the Greeks wanted wisdom, what does the world today want? The world today wants affirmation and acceptance. But the word of the cross is a word of self-denial. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? The word of the cross separates. There are two kinds of people in the world. Those who are perishing and those who are being saved. The word of the cross saves. Because it shows us that God did for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We cannot bring anything, add to or take away from what Jesus has done on the cross. We can only accept it in the way that God has designed And the word of the cross scandalizes. And that sounds really bad. But I'm really happy. Because the cross forces us to take a real look at what this world is and where it is going and see that there is something better. The late George Carlin, an inflammatory comedian, made a statement along the lines of, I would never be part of a group that took as its symbol a man who was nailed to two pieces of wood. Oh, but I'm glad I am. If you're not this morning, you have an opportunity. God invites you, as He has invited all people through the death of His Son on the cross, to embrace His wisdom, to embrace His power, to embrace the gift that He has secured for you. In Jesus Christ. If you need to do so this morning, or if you are a Christian and you need prayers from your fellow Christians, won't you come now as we stand and as we sing together?